Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today we're talking jig fishing. I've got four tips that are going to help you put more fish in the boat this fall with a jig. The vast majority of my fall fishing revolves around fast moving baits. Crankbaits, jerk baits, top water, underspins, swim baits, baits that are moving and draw a core feed response. But there is a special place in my heart for a well-placed jig in the fall. The jig is one of those baits that just cannot be overlooked. They have an incredible ability to catch big bass. So if I'm going to slow down, if I'm going to be fishing on the bottom, making bottom contact, I'm probably doing it with a jig this time of year. So what I've done today is I've come up with a little bit different way of doing this. I've come up with four scenarios and one or more, maybe all of these scenarios is going to speak to you and the places that you fish. And you can take that information and apply it to that scenario to catch more fish this fall. So essentially we've got, uh, I have not forgotten the guys who don't have grass. So we've got for the guys that have no grass, that just have hard bottom, have rock, I've got something for you. Those guys that are fishing a lot of highland reservoirs, fishing a lot of offshore, we've got something there. The guys that are just on that true finesse fishery, you know, you just, I've got a bunch of waves rolling in here. You just don't seem to have that many big fish in there. Or maybe you do, but they, it's clear water and they just don't seem to want to eat a bigger presentation. So it seems like when you're successful, you're downsizing. The next guy, the guy who's got a bunch of grass, but that grass is already dying back. You know, we're, we're in the heart of fall now. There's no way around it. So on some fisheries, you had good grass, but it's already fading away. Those fish are starting to pull to hard structure and hard cover. And then the last guy is the guy who's still got a ton of grass. Maybe you're on the Tennessee River. Maybe you're in the deep south. You've still got a lot of grass, a lot of mats. I've got something for you too. So for each one of those scenarios, we're gonna talk about them individually. And in each scenario, I'm gonna give you two jigs. So you've got an option, okay? Two jigs for each scenario, how to apply them, and then also a relevant rod for each situation. Now you know that you can go down the rabbit hole or not. You can keep this simple. You could take a, any medium heavy rod, a seven foot medium heavy, and you can go out and you can throw most jigs and land most fish. And if you're gonna do that, you could probably buy one jig, that one right there, for the guy who doesn't wanna go down the rabbit hole with me today. I wasn't even gonna do this, but I'll do it for you. If you could only have one jig, this is a pitching jig, half ounce pitching jig. In the video description, I'm linking all of this for you, but I'll link this first. So if you could only have one, a half ounce pitch and jig with a beaver for a trailer. You could take that and put it on a medium heavy rod, 15 to 18 pound line and just go fishing. And most of the time you're gonna do all right. You could just take that and go. That could be the only jig you ever buy. Buy it in go to, these are colors, go to green pumpkin craw, brown craw, that's brown craw there something really natural, pair it up with a green pumpkin or a green pumpkin red trailer, you're in business. It'll do most things. And some guys who are watching this, that's all you need to know. If you take that and go out and fish this fall, you've got a shot at catching a monster bass. But as you guys know, you can also take that leap and you can go down the rabbit hole. We're not gonna go too deep today. That's why I came up with these specific scenarios and we're going to talk about each one of those instead of just stacking boxes up and going in deep because those of you who have been with us for two years five years ten plus years 
you know I'm more fanatical about jigs than anything else. So we could stack the boxes up and really play this game, but we don't need to. Okay, so for the first guy, the guy who just, your fishery doesn't have a lot of grass. It's probably a highland reservoir. A lot of fluctuation, that's usually why you don't have grass. Those places usually have a lot of rock. Portions of those lakes will have a lot of laydowns in them, but not all of the lakes, sometimes it's just rock. Maybe you've got some long tapering points, offshore humps, that sort of thing. For you, in the fall, you are just not going to beat a football jig. You're just not going to do it. They work so well, okay? So this is a Dirty Jigs Finesse football. See that hook there? That's the Finesse hook. I throw that because I can get away with lighter line. We're talking fall, but this carries into winter. And the colder that water gets, the less those bass pull back. They just don't pull as hard when the water's cold. So you can get away with that finesse football hook instead of a standard football hook. And you can throw it on a lighter line to get more bites. Um, I focus my colors in on either green pumpkin brown Brown purple, cinnamon purple. Specifically, this is super matte brown. My green pumpkin and brown would be the go-to color or something in the brown orange realm, like an Alabama craw or like that guy, a true brown orange. But that Dirty Jigs, half ounce would be my standard, okay? With a half ounce, I can fish shallow, but I can also fish super deep. And I can still set that hook on say 12 pound line, very comfortably, even in deep water. And you can go lighter than that, but I just know that I can put it to them with 12 pound. Okay, the beauty of a football is that if you're around a lot of rock, you can fish it through that rock and it will hang up, but the shape of the head doesn't wedge into things. It'll just get hung up. If you shake it and pop that rod, it'll come out of most things. So where another head would smoothly drag across the bottom, a football will catch and need to be popped free. Well, that might seem like a bad thing at first, but a lot of your bites are a reaction. So if you're hanging that thing up and shaking it free, pulling it, getting it hung up, shaking it free, a lot of those fish, they'll be following along and when it pops free, that's when they smash it. So that is a great bonus that that head gets hung up but doesn't actually get stuck. You're not breaking it off. You can shake it out of almost all the snags. Now, if you don't have rock, if you've got a mud bottom, maybe you got a lot of clay, sometimes those lakes will get a lot of that silt deposited in the, the creek beds or in the Vs going down the middles of the coves. And those fish will lay on that. If you've ever pulled a football jig in clear water on that silty bottom, I mean, you might as well be down there with a shovel throwing silt up and just making a mess. This thing will leave a mud trail across the bottom because it's just plowing. And those fish, there's something about it. They just come to see what is causing that commotion and then they'll pluck that jig off. It works really well. I pair it up with a Yamamoto double tail grub. That's the double tail comes in a four inch and a five inch. Now that sizing is misleading. This is a four inch, but the five inch is not much larger. When the water's really cool or here, I've actually trimmed the skirt up to get a little smaller profile. I use the four inch. Other, oh, the one in my other hand is a five inch. Perfect. Normally I use a five inch. So here's a, here's a comparison. See, there's not a lot of difference there. It's just thicker. The legs are thicker, the body's thicker. So my standard is a five inch, but if I'm trying to get those extra bites and I trim everything up, I go to a four inch, okay? Double tail grub. Now this guy, if a guy's on a budget, you can switch over to this one right here. This guy is a bass patrol. It's a less expensive jig, but it's not just about being on a budget. It's also a round rubber jig. A lot of guys know the magic of round rubber and cold water. This is a great option. You'll save a little money. You have less color options. Brown orange, brown purple, 
brown green pumpkin, those are great options. So you still have, even though there's less total options, you still have the key options, the ones that I like. But that is a really good jig on a budget. It's got a good hook in it. You can stick those fish with that. That is a fantastic reservoir jig. Okay, so if that's your scenario, you already know, football jig. Half ounce would be my standard finesse football, lighter line, double tail grub. Now let's go true finesse. Then we'll go to the guy whose grass is dying back and then we'll go to the guy who's still got a ton of grass. Okay, that's how we're gonna do it today. Uh, actually, let me back up. Throw in that football. That football is the one that's probably the most universal in terms of the rod you can throw it on. Most softer rods, medium, medium heavy rods will do it. But if you are a jig fanatic, if you are looking for that just perfect rod, because every jig is different, the guys who do this a lot know, every jig is different and every single one could take a different rod and it really will change your hookup ratio. It'll change your landing ratio. It'll help you react to those bites better. The best rod that I've found for throwing a finesse football is the 844 MBR. Okay, so this is a G Loomis NRX Plus, uh, paired with a Metanium DC. Light braid, 40 pound braid to a liter. And it's funny, because I have a topwater tied on here. That should, and it's a small topwater at that. That's a, a, a shower blows 105. That should tell you how universal this rod is, okay? The MBRs are remarkable at being adaptable. This same rod that can throw that top water and keep those trebles pinned can throw these jig hooks and keep those fish pinned too. It's all about the way this rod transitions from this light tip to this mid to a stout butt section. That is the best rod that I have found for those finesse footballs. Uh, the nice thing is that the MBRs can be found through the entire G Loomis line. So this is an NRX Plus. That's the rod that I've been throwing it on. Uh, but you can also carry that all the way down through the line, all the way down to the GCX, which is still a fantastic rod, still offered in the exact same 844 MBR uh, and saves you a bundle of money. So you can get the action at every price point and you're just changing sensitivity as you go up in price. But that is my favorite rod for that scenario. Now, next up, let's go micro, okay? These little guys right here, when do you throw micro jigs? And I don't even know if that's the proper name for them, but that is, that is what I call them, micro jigs, right? I love throwing these little guys. When the going gets tough, I throw little micro jigs. When I know that I can catch them on a Ned rig, I can catch them on a tube, I can catch them on a drop shot, but I wanna see if there aren't bigger fish around, I switch to that micro jig because I'll still get a ton of bites. I'm still about the same size as a Ned rig, uh, but it just, for whatever reason, gets that bigger bite. I love it. So if you are on a lake where finesse just seems to be your game, Maybe it's not a lake, maybe you're on a river. This is a great option for moving water too. But maybe you're just like what I just described, Highland Reservoir, clearer water, offshore structures. The little micro jigs can work in a ton of different circumstances. But if you want to throw a jig and you're struggling to get bit, throw that downsized jig. Because it will still tend to get a bigger overall bite than true finesse, than a Ned or a plastic worm. They just do. So two different jigs that play in this category. Nishini, I'm guessing at the name. We reviewed these, whoop, we reviewed these earlier this year and I've had a blast with this jig. So this little guy, what I like about it, it's a lead head. So you're not gonna spend a fortune on the jig. They keep their, comp their colors simple, but they're really nice. No weed guard. And then it's got a fantastic hook in it. It's actually a pretty stout hook, even though it's light wire. I've got that one 
paired up to that Z-Man Cross, that little Ned Cross there. That guy is an amazing little package. I love, if you are in a fishery that doesn't have a lot of debris on the bottom, I love fishing a jig with no weed guard. Because a lot of times those fish should just come up and mouth that jig just to see what it is. And if the only thing that's sticking up is a sticky sharp, I mean, it's hanging in my finger right there, a sticky sharp hook point, it'll get them. Your hookup ratio is just unmatched by anything else. Phenomenal. If they pick it up, you've got them. You don't even have to hardly set the hook. You just lean back and there's a fish there and you've got them. Right? It just works. It's an awesome little package. And when I'm throwing these little jigs, sometimes you want action, sometimes you don't. So that little cross on there doesn't have a lot of action, but it does stand up in the water. Those claws lift up off the bottom and it's just a great overall profile that just flat gets bit. Now the other one that I dropped down here, this is the little peewee jig. And it's a football head, little tiny hook in there. And it's got a keeper on it. It's got a single wire keeper on it. Okay. I've been really happy with this little guy too. This one has a micro cut skirt on it. So super thin skirt material. Hopefully you can make that out. This one's really thin too, honestly. They're both really thin, really small profiles. I paired this one up with the little tiny pack of chunk. Sometimes you want action, sometimes you don't. This has a ton of action. Those little legs will kick. If you're bouncing along the bottom, if you're in current, like, I mean, I'm not sure I could speak to a better little creek jig than that right there. Just a phenomenal little guy. But it's also so good in reservoirs in the fall. The way I like to fish these is about as basic as fishing gets. I like to fish them on those steeper banks, okay? So think main lake points, uh, but a lot of those highland reservoirs don't have, you know, long tapering points. They just have where arms come together, rounded bluff type points, steep points, but they're usually rocky. I like to sit out off those points, fire that thing way up in there, up shallow, then just hop it and let it fall down that rock. Just work it a little bit, let it fall. And I'll fish it from two feet of water out to 40 feet of water and just figure out what depth those fish are at. And then I can repeat that around the lake. They just seem to shine the closer we get to winter as those fish begin to gather where arms come together, mouths of creeks, things like that. Those fish will gather on those corners because they've been backing out of the backwaters and they've got nowhere else to go. They just stack up at those intersections. You can figure out that they're all at about 25 foot. You don't have to throw quite as shallow or work it quite as far. You throw it halfway to the bank, work it down, catch that fish. Halfway to the bank, work it down. That's what I like to do with them. And then you'll find some days they want that profile with less action and other days they want more action. So I'm prepared for both. The other jig that, that plays really well in this category is that Kitek tungsten jig. Uh, I throw that one a ton too. They have been hard to get this year. They're constantly sold out, but that's another really good option. I promise two, I guess I said three, but I try. I try to keep it simple. You guys know I get crazy about this stuff. Now, as far as, whoop, as, far as throwing them goes, this is a jig you can throw on really light stuff. I actually use my jerkbait rod, my X-Pride 610 medium with my Aldebaran. And uh, if I'm fishing it dedicated to the purpose, then I spool up braid, okay? I go 20 pound braid to like a 10 pound leader. And that's what I fish for that jig. But I find a lot of times in the fall, you guys know I like to power fish, I like to reaction fish, so I've always got a jerk bait in the boat. And a lot of times I'll, I'll have straight fluoro on with that jerk bait and I just clip that jerk bait on, tie that little football jig on and go check that bite midday after my reaction has slowed down. So I, I find that I fish it a lot on that exact 
setup. Now, for those of you that watched the jerk bait video, that X Pride 610 medium sold out again. It it happens. It happens every time that rod is in stock. Uh, the one thing I will tell you, if you're still looking for a 610 medium, is uh, Shimano recently re-released the Corrado line, and they rock now. They're really good, uh, and they have the 610 medium in the Corrado line. And the last time I looked, they were in stock. So it is a very similar action to the X Pride. I would fish that for the jerk bait. You can also use it for this technique uh, and it will save you a little bit of money over the X Pride as well. So here I fish the X Pride with an Aldebaran. That's my jerk bait setup. It's what I throw these little guys on. Uh, with that Corrado, I'd pair it up to that Corrado 70 MGL and you'll be dialed. Hopefully this is helping you guys. I think it will because we're talking about such narrow specific circumstances and I know that at least one of these will apply for the vast majority of you. Uh, obviously Tim and I travel more than most but we run into all of these scenarios in the fall. That's why we carry all these different things. Uh, next one, this is probably the most common circumstance right now around the whole country. And that is that you have got grass, but your grass, as we're getting cooler and cooler and cooler, your grass is dying. Maybe your grass is gone, or maybe the vast majority of it has now turned brown and is dying back. The grass does not have to be gone for the fish to abandon it. As soon as that grass is dying, it is no longer producing oxygen and the fish vacate. They will go to the grass that is still alive, but they also go to hard cover. This is probably, if I could just, in my mind, if I could sit here and think, when is the coolest time of the entire year to throw a jig? It would be the exact situation I'm about to describe. And I have a place in mind when I describe it, but it plays out all over the country. Picture a place where you just had fields of grass. Okay, just grass for miles. A lot of lakes have that. Grass lines, they just follow shore and just go. The spot that I'm thinking of is on Clear Lake, but this could be anywhere in the country. You've got all this grass and the bass could be anywhere, anywhere. If you've ever seen Gunnersville in the fall, there's grass for 50 miles. Okay, when the fish are in that, it can be so overwhelming. But when grass dies back, it dies back in a blink. And what will happen when that grass dies back, those fish that were spread over a quarter mile, that grass is no longer an option for them. Well, guess what? There might have been two tree stumps out there. Or over on the bank adjacent to it, there might be five laydowns. If there's no rock, Every bass that was in that grass is now on those exact pieces of hard cover. You know exactly where they are. And now it's just a matter of catching them. And that is where the pitching jig comes into play. The pitching jig, as I said in the beginning, is that all around jig. It will do everything. It will fish in every circumstance. It's not perfect for everything, but it can do everything. That's why it's the one jig I would carry. You could pretend it's a football jig, throw it in that lake. You can flip it into grass. It's not perfect, but it will do it. You can flip it in cover. You can fish rock. You can do all sorts of things with it. But my ideal, when I close my eyes and I think fall, my ideal is that grass is dying back. The bass have gone to wood and you go in there with a pitching jig. The value of a pitching jig is that round head. Wood specifically, where the branches come into the trunk of that tree, creates a V. If you have a flipping style head, a V style head, perfect for grass, it will go into that V and it is stuck. You don't even have to get stuck on the hook. You are breaking off, it's over. Pitching jigs don't do that. They come in there, they stick and much like a football, you can shake them and pop them and out they come. So you can fish it through the worst wood if you're just methodical. And I will take that jig, I'll get up near that wood, fire it into the wood from a distance first, 
Just fish it up and through those branches, let it fall back down. Pull it up, feel it rubbing, pull it over the branch, let it fall back down. And then if I don't catch a fish doing that, then I'll get close to that wood and pick it apart. I love to throw a half ounce with a beaver for a trailer. It just, it's enough weight to continuously drop down and it's a great overall package and profile. I'll typically throw it on heavier line. I'm fishing it on braid to leader. That's what I like. Uh, if you're a fluoro guy, 20 pounds. Same thing with my braid. I'm fishing 50 to 65 pound braid just because it's comfortable, but I'm tying a 20 pound leader. It's heavy enough that when I hook them in that wood, I can usually get them out. And it's got a good stout hook in it. So 20 is perfect. Can you go lighter? Of course. You could set it all day long on 14 pound, 15 pound, uh, but 20 will help you get those fish back out of that cover. Now I said for every situation, I've got two jigs. This is a compact pitching jig. Look at the difference, not in the size of the wire of the hook per se, although it is smaller, but look at the length. That's where you can tell the, the most obvious. Let me put the eye next to the eye. See how much shorter this one is? Like a good quarter inch shorter. The wire size is smaller too. The compact pitching jig just allows me to drop down in size, okay? If the fish just aren't reacting the way I want, I can back it off. And with this one, I can be throwing that on 12 to 15 pound line instead of the 20. Now, am I gonna break off more? Yes. If you get a big one in that wood on 14 pound or 12 pound, you're in trouble unless they swim out. But the other place where this plays really well and where that is an advantage, it's not just lay downs, it's also dock pilings. The fish that have been out in front of the docks in the grass will suck up to those pilings. Well, the pilings aren't near as snaggy, so I could fish that compact pitch, pitch and jig right up against that stuff. And then when you hook those fish, if you hook a fish under a dock and you don't horse them, I mean, if you're bulldogging on them, they will battle you to the end and wrap you around in there. But just a quick trick for you, if you stick them, and obviously you have to keep pressure on them, don't get me wrong, you're fighting these fish. But if you're not just winching on them, they will typically follow the pressure of the line and swim out of that dock. So you can be throwing that on 12 or 14 or 15, stick those fish up along dock pilings, and then just lead those fish out, out into the open water and then battle them. That is a great option. So again, same deal. Sometimes I want that dead action. Sometimes I want movement. That's that beaver. This is that slim paca. So it's not a chunk. It's an actual creature bait. I took a little bit off the top just because, I don't know, it's a personal confidence thing. I don't know if it even really matters, but my whole life, same with the beaver, I've taken four ribs off the top of that beaver. I just like what that does to the overall profile. It doesn't stick out so far. So same thing with that pack of slim. I took just a little bit off the top and I just like that overall profile. Personal confidence, right? But I've believed in it for years, so it's worth a try. Uh, and then same thing with colors. You keep it simple, an Alabama craw, a go-to, a brown craw, you know, Super matte brown is about as wild as I get, and that's brown, cinnamon, purple. I keep my colors very natural. If you wanna play and add a bunch of color, do it with the trailer. But otherwise, just stick with a green, whoop. green pumpkin black, green pumpkin red. Very, very simple this time of year. For those, now a bunch of you, as soon as I pick up a Mega Bass, it's an Orochi, a bunch of you already know what this is gonna be. This is a Brailleist. The Brailleist, hands down, is my favorite jig rod, and they are back in stock. Now I say favorite jig rod, I mean favorite all around jig rod. If I could only have one, it's a Brailleist. The Brailleist is just a workhorse of a jig rod. Now it's a little too stout for a finesse football. It'll throw a regular football all day long, It'll throw a pitch and jig and you can make it throw a flip and jig. But if you just want that dialed pitch and jig rod, that perfect rod for the job, you're not trying to be universal. You want the perfect 
rod. I throw a Brailleist with a Metanium. I swear by the Brailleist so much. They were out of stock for what, like a year and a half? They came back in stock briefly this summer and they sold out in like two days after a year and a half that they'd been gone. I still, that entire time you couldn't get them, just continued to tell the truth. The Brailleist is an incredible jig rod. And I checked this morning, I was just pure curiosity. I'm like, I wonder if the Brailleist is back. Oh my gosh, there's five plus, they are in stock. So I throw the Brailleist with the Metanium, 65 pound braid, but I throw Max Quattro braid on a lot of stuff. I'm sure you guys have noticed that if you use our links. Max Quattro, is a full size thinner than other braids. So I'm throwing 65, but it feels like 50. That's how I get away with that. Sometimes guys are like, well, what are you using 50 for? I'm not using it because I need 50 pound, especially if I'm tying it to 15, obviously. But I'm using it because of how it lays down on the spool, how comfortable it is to fish. I'm able to tie very smooth knots in it. It's a good transition to 15 or 20 pound line. But I do, I love that Max Quattro, and I love that Braille list, and you can finally get them again. So for those that have been waiting, you can get them. Last but not least, let's talk about the grass guy. This will be my last jig tip for you today, all right? For the guy who's still got a ton of grass, maybe you're here on the Tennessee River where we're just coming into frog season. Maybe, and guys in the West are like, coming into frog season? Patterns are not the same as you go around the country. The patterns are the same, but the timing can be off. At, on the Tennessee River, as they draw the current down, or they draw the water down in the fall, more and more grass is exposed and it begins to mat up. And all of a sudden there's this amazing late season frog bite. Other parts of the country, that grass is just completely dying off. That's why we speak to such a very different circumstances because there are different people on different timelines and we try to be aware of that and help everybody. Uh, maybe you're farther south than we are, right? Maybe you're in the true deep south. Maybe you're a Florida guy. You've still got endless grass that will never go away. Tip for you, for that guy, if you're, if you're flipping, if you're punching, this is my favorite flipping stick. X-Pride 711 Extra Heavy. It is a pool cue, but it weighs nothing. It's amazing. The guy who's out there punching, punching and flipping. I don't care what the bait is. This is literally what was tied on my rod. I didn't tie it on for this. That's what I was flipping the other day. It's pretty beat up though. It's been chewed on. Anyway, take that off, put a jig on. Why would you do that? Well, this time of year, the grass might start dying back a little bit and you can get away with a jig. You can put a jig where you couldn't before. In general, I need to size up my jig one size. So if I can get half ounce tungsten through the grass, I probably need a three quarter jig, okay? So just know that. Uh, so you've gotta make sure you can get the jig through. But if you can get the jig through the grass, you are way better off throwing a jig than throwing a Texas rig in most circumstances. The reason why is that stout weed guard. See on this jig, the weed guard is stiff. What that does is put a ton of back pressure on those fish. So this is a no jack. That means in short, the hook is gigantic. It is a gaff. That guy right there, if I put that through a mat and a fish eats it, I'm landing them. I've got them hooked on a giant straight shank hook and even better than that. So now I'm punched through with that straight shank. But now I have a, a weed guard that's folded over that's pushing back and creating back pressure against that fish's lip holding that hook point in place. So flipping with a Texas rig is great. I do it all the time, but you just know that sometimes fish come off. It's a ton of, a ton of weight, a ton of lead, a ton of tungsten out in front of their mouth with a hook point poked in and they are thrashing. Oh, 
I got that too close to my face, got a big old whiff of that plastic. Those fish are thrashing and some of them just come off. The right rod helps a lot, but it's never gonna be perfect. The last thing in the world I want is to hook a giant in the mat and lose them. If you can get a jig through, your odds of hooking that giant in the mat and getting them out skyrocket. If you can't get the jig in, you can't get the jig in. But if you can, do it. Now, this no jack, that's that pointed head. It just splits the grass perfectly. Really helps it getting in and out. And again, that no jack hook is everything. Now, when I'm fishing grass, I do want that trailer to have some action, some movement as it's falling. So again, I'll link them all down in the video description for you, but that's the full size. If I'm going to downsize, maybe the water in that grass is clear. A lot of times the water in the grass is crystal clear. Maybe that grass is thinner and I can get away with it. This is the Canterbury flipping jig. Same exact head, now granted these are two different sizes, but same exact head, but significantly lighter wire hook. Hopefully I can find a way to turn them and compare them for you. Let me pull the skirts out of the way. Significantly smaller and lighter hook there. So if I can get away with downsizing, I can go to a lighter head, lighter hook, lighter line. Here, I'm fishing straight braid, and if I'm not, I'm probably fishing 25 pound leader. Here, I could throw this on 14, 15 pound if I need to. I could throw it on 20 pound, but I could still throw it on straight braid. Just depends on the circumstances, but I can downsize everything. So full bodied versus a chunk trailer. Both are still kicking, obviously. You always want movement as you're coming down through that canopy. Now, <laughs> this one, I just cut this one off a rod to show to you guys. I didn't even pay attention to the fact that this had this big old chunk of chartreuse in there, but I took this right off a rod from a recent trip down in Florida. That is one of my tricks. That's, I think the first time I talked about that was probably 10 years ago, but I've only talked about it once or twice. I. I don't know, personal confidence, right? This is just a trick I use. I use it in muddy water, and I like to use it under that mat too. Uh, that little chartreuse body, that's a piece of a Senko is all that is. Clip off half, three quarters of an inch of Senko, thread that on, and then throw that chunk on behind it. It just helps them find it, it's different. You wanna look different than the next guy? Put a little chartreuse body inside that jig. Those fish have not seen that. They will find it and they will eat it. It's just being different. Now, fishing those big guys again, I use my true dedicated flipping stick. I absolutely love my 7-Eleven Extra Heavy. It's phenomenal. Just Corrado 200. Uh, I use a, a high gear or an extra high gear, so an HG or an XG, seven to one, eight to one. You want to put it to them, depending on how heavy the cover is. You know, if you're hooking them in grass, grass is different than vines. If you hook a bass in grass, you just battle them, you get them out of there. The problem with vines is that if you get through over there and that thing goes down, a fish eats it, and that fish can get over here, you can't land them. You have to pull them all the way back up through that mat and out that hole in the vines and then back to you. So I like that high gear reel where I can smash them and just do everything I can and just try and force those fish come my way as fast as I can and get out of that mat. Again, grass, not so bad. If you're in vines, whole nother animal. But guys, I hope this helps you. Fall is a fantastic time to throw a jig. As grass dies back, fish pull the hard cover. They pull the structure. I know a lot of guys uh, hear us say grass and their ears just close and they don't realize that we are talking to them too. You can adapt. You can do these same things. You know that now. You can do these same things whether you have grass or not, whether you have lay down wood or not, whether you're bare rock, you're mud flat, or you're a field of matted vegetation. 
you can throw a jig and you can catch great big fish doing it. I spend most of the fall throwing reaction baits, but I will always, always have that jig on board because when that bite slows, I can start picking that cover apart. And if I can get a jig in there, I've got better odds than I do with a Texas rig. I can catch them on a Texas rig too, and it's a great option. I did that in that kayak video recently. That's what I had with me. I didn't have a jig out there. Little Texas rig, stuck a great big bass from the kayak at the end of the day when they'd become lethargic and were holed up in the cover. But if I could get a jig in that same situation, I've got even better odds of getting that fish out. Guys, I hope this video helps you. If it did, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.